fine? Yeah, it's okay it's Yeah, it's fine. Okay, welcome to the new speaker, João Magaja from uh, Imperial College in London. Okay, so um, as you've seen this morning, there's, there's many slants to breaking Lorentz invariant. There's a particle physics slant, which you take the Lagrangian of the standard model and you, you mess it up you know, with things that break Lorentz invariant. The quantum gravity side of the story, there's, um, you know, there's an astrophysical side of the phenomenology which typically uses special relativity and you deform it. And, um, and there's a cosmology side of the story as well. Oops. And um, in the absence of observational data, because the fact is every anomaly has gone away, as it was just pointed out, um, what actually tends to happen is that there's some sociological, this is a sociological comment, there's a bit of a prima donna kind of feeling within the community. Everyone thinks their formalism is the own and only and don't look at, doesn't look at the other. So you've seen this kind of conflict just now, like the question you asked Giovanni. I mean, we all kind of look at things in a very peculiar way and think basically prejudice on our background, depending on whether it's particle physics or not. And, you know, this is a bit of kind of a sad thing and it's very good that actually a conference like this or a, a workshop like this was organized, at least we, we listen to each other. So let me sing you the cosmology opera now, no pun intended here. What I'm going to be doing is just show something completely different uh, where the driving force is actually cosmology. So as Giovanni said, it's very difficult to do cosmology. And in fact, it's very difficult to do field theory with ESR. You have to do other things which are more adjusted. Maybe one day <coughs> we'll be able to unify the whole thing into one single framework. So first of all, let's not get tangled with the concept. Some of these are just words, others are actually differences. So Lorentz invariance, if we're going to break it, it encompasses two things, preferred frames and constancy of the speed of light, and they're really independent concepts. And when you put these in curved space-time, and you see this particularly in the Palatini formalism, there really are, there is a factor between what you call local Lorentz invariance and diffeomorphism invariance, and they're really different things and when you try and break it, you'd rather be sure what you're actually breaking, you can actually mix and match at will. And specifically, you can have theories with preferred frames with, with a constant speed of light. You can have constant speed of light with no preferred frames, and in fact, we've seen examples already, you can break everything. So once you start, we might as well go and break everything. That's a possibility, and it's the same thing with curved space-time. You can break diffeomorphism invariance and local Lorentz invariance independently or together, if you wish. So there really isn't just one way to do the break Lorentz invariance as a huge, once, once you go beyond the standard theory, there really is a forest of possible theories. The emphasis on this talk is going to be, so as I said, my, my opera here is going to be varying speed of light theories, which I will consider with or without preferred frames, with or without diffeomorphism invariance, but always with this feature. With our mind, with, with, with view of apl applications to cosmology, and the two things I'm going to be mentioning are the horizon and flatness problems, which are really just a pedagogic thing. No one really cares about these problems. It's just some kind of thing the cosmologists do. Primordial fluctuations, on the other hand, is, this is really hardcore physics. So there are some fluctuations in the universe. We see them. We measure them to incredible precision. If you have any theory which has any any hope of being respectable in cosmology, you'd rather, you'd better explain that as well. Okay, so what's the story of why varying, why varying speed of light? Well, actually, the idea of varying constants is a very old one and very respectable. It goes back to Dirac. Dirac, as far as I know, in the 30s, was the first person to introduce the idea that in cosmology we should perhaps broaden our mind. This is a very nice citation I love reading for you. One field of work in which there has been too much speculation is cosmology. Everyone agrees with this. Its models are probably all wrong. I think everyone agrees with this too. It is usually assumed that the laws of nature have always been the same as they are now. Incredible extrapolation, okay? So basically you measure things in the laboratory and you hope that at the beginning of the universe the story was the same. There is no justification for this. And in particular, quantities which are considered to be constants of nature maybe varying in cosmological time. So this is really what started up the field of varying constants in cosmology. Something which is not widely known is that he wrote this paper during 
is honeymoon. I don't know exactly how many of you are married and have written a paper during your honeymoon. I have no idea what his wife thought about this. <laughs> but um, the, the reactions were very mixed, and in fact, this is what Niels Bohr said at the time. Look at what happens to people when they get married. <laughs> this was not very well received initially, and in fact, the worst insult I saw, the very constant, was this guy Dingle in Nature, called it the pseudoscience of invertebrate cosmetology. So that's the kind of level at which the idea was received. All these years on, actually what he was doing is not that controversial. And in fact, it's become part and parcel of most modern theories. If you look about it, you know, the basic turning point was probably Brand's Dickey theory. As Giovanni said, you can only test the theory by testing the alternatives and refuting them. So this was actually a very nice way to test relativity, come up with something like Brand's Dickey theory, which is not obviously wrong immediately and then you can put constraints on that theory. And Brand's Dicke theory is a theory with a varying G. Then in the 1980s, actually, Beckenstein, a bit against the grain at the time, proposed a varying E theory, which is very interesting, and which connected very interestingly with his observations of varying alpha, et cetera. Nowadays, basically, any dilaton theory is a theory in which the parameters of the standard model, for which we have no justification, appear as variables, appear as dynamical variables. And the only thing which is really different here is exactly, this is untouchable. Usually H bar and C are untouchable because they're structural. If you make them varying dynamical things, you cause structural damage to the formalism. And on the other hand, this is exactly why varying C might be interesting if you're studying Lorentz violations, Lorentz invariance violations. So there's, a, there's certainly a potential for damage to Lorentz invariance <coughs> to appear when you have a varying C. So that's the connecting point between the subject of this workshop and what I'm going to talk about. Historically, there's been some kind of division between theories of varying C in space-time and theories in which C depends on the energy. You look at the rainbow, different colors, <coughs> they have different speeds. Space-time variations in C is really like a la Dirac. It's basically a perspective in which you go near a black hole, C varies, you go to the beginning of the universe, C varies, etc., etc. Uh, quantum gravity is associated with this cosmology with that. I don't see why we shouldn't also mix and match here. This hasn't been done. You'll see why. There are technical reasons, but there's no reasons why this shouldn't be attempted. So there's a huge array of theories, and, well, I listed a few. So variations in E, obviously, that was the subject of the previous talk. Variations in position, well, there's really different frameworks. Some are very dramatic. Some you break everything you can think of. That's exactly what I did with Andy Albrecht like some more than 10 years ago. What John Moffat did by metric theories and so on are really quite conservative. So you can, you have a range of possibilities and that's what I'm going to explore here. You can go between total lunacy and really boring things. And you basically, you have like a, a cursor, you can basically change it. And I think you'll agree with me, this is very, very soft violation of Lorentz invariance. There's even a way of doing it without any violation of Lorentz invariance. And I can be completely brutal. The point is, if you don't care about being a lunatic, in fact, the easiest way to do is break everything. So if you just go to your formalism and you start putting C's of T's everywhere, you actually break everything. That's the simplest thing. You also end up with a complete mess and with very big repercussions on everything. So let me kind of show you the taste, uh, give, you a ta show you, give you a taste of the two extremes. So this is what happens if you do hard breaking of Lorentz invariance and also diffeomorphism invariance. If you're really completely careless about the way you do it, you end up with a lun completely lunatic theory. Is it really that lunatic? Well, as I'm going to show you in a minute, it's actually something that's been very popular in the last two years is an example of that, which is Ojava Lifshitz. Okay? So a very nice framework for doing these things is if you want to break not only Lorentz invariance locally, but also diffeomorphism invariance, here's a prescription. Consider a preferred frame, which can be the cosmological frame, but doesn't need to be. And then go to you know, some textbook and take relativity, or anything you wish, and apply a 3 plus 1 decomposition. So this could be Ash Decker, but could also just be the ADM uh, breakout. And then mess it up. Okay, once you broke the 4 into 3 plus 1, mess it up in a way, that you cannot reconstitute the 4D theory. So you've introduced the preferred frame in your formalism by doing this, and you've broken the few morphism invariance consequently. 
So as I said, this may sound crazy, but basically, Ojava leaf sheets is an example of this, and brute force varying speed of light is a, another example of that. So these things invariably have one thing in common, the questions look a mess. Uh, so this is Ojava leaf sheets, but they only look a mess because three plus one is a mess, okay? So imagine I do a three plus one decomposition of your Einstein-Hilbert action. So you end up with the formulae which are already quite complicated, but for example, the kinetic term, you have this extrinsic curvature, and this parameter is one in general relativity. Well, let's make it not one. Then you cannot reconstitute the 4D theory. You have broken the diffeomorphism invariant. In this case, time diffeomorphism invariant, but you could break others. You could break the, you could break the full diffeomorphisms. And invariably, you end up with something which is not nice, but it's also peculiar to this frame. You broke it there, you cannot transform again, or rather you can transform to another frame, but the equations, if they look bad here, they will look worse in a different frame. So that's one example. In fact, the brute force varying speed of light is nothing but the same, but putting C's of T's everywhere in the formalism. And you could say this C of T is something which is like an intrinsic variation, so you're breaking diffeomorphism invariance. It could be a phase transition be another profile, we'll discuss that. And invariably what you find is, if you take these equations, they're a mess, but they have the property that they would look completely different in a different frame. So I really have diffeomorphism invariance broken. And typically you find the Bianchi identities are violated, if you do this, diffeomorphism are violated. And because these things come together, you actually violate stress energy conservation too. So this is the most extreme thing I can do. This is brute force violation of Lorentz invariance and everything else. It's the idea here is, since I'm at it, I might as well just destroy everything, and that's what happens. So what? Well, indeed, so nothing. Obviously, I don't want that to conflict with experiment, but if this is something that happens only at the Planck scale, or something that only happens at the beginning of the universe, this may actually be useful, for example, for dealing with the divergences of various particle physics diagrams in quantum gravity, for example, dealing with the problems of the Big Bang. So I just have to be very careful. This is done in a way that's restricted to very extreme situations, precisely to be useful to solve some problems which I've encountered. Okay, let me give an example. I'm gonna be, so this is the first, first part of the talk is crazy stuff, but let me put a focus on the horizon and the homogeneity problem, and later on I go to structure formation with less crazy theories. <laughs> Um, this is really a cosmologist kind. You can see this happening in a pub, and it was actually in a pub, okay? This is the kind of argument you could come up with. There is a problem in cosmology called the horizon problem, which is that as you go back in time, the horizon becomes small, very small. You take a commoving, to be more precise, you take a commoving bit of the universe, you go back in time, and this contains more and more commoving horizons. So this creates a problem, which is you cannot explain the features of the universe, namely the homogeneity of the universe, Okay, take a pint of beer, and this is your idea, okay? So you basically just open up the horizons with the varying speed of light. As Giovanni said, obviously there are implications for causality in any theory in which you have a property like this, and this is the obvious implication. You don't need inflation to actually open up the horizons. This just happens naturally. So this is a trivial statement. What is not trivial is that you gain lots of things on top. So yet again, this is, you know, perhaps it's just pedagogic, it's really the structure formation that matters. But let me give you the example of the flatness problem. So you're gonna have crazy things in your theory, but are these crazy things bad? And in fact, they're not, they're great. So look at what happens to the flatness problem. The flatness problem is the fact I have three different models. I have, if my density for a given expansion factor is above the critical density, I have a closed universe. If it's subcritical, it's open. If it's critical, it's flat. This is cool. This is not cool because I end up crunching or empty very quickly. And the flatness problem is the fact that any deviation from flatness progresses very quickly into a crunch or an empty universe, a milled universe. So the flatness problem is something you have to cure somehow in the early universe to explain why we're still here. Okay, you know how inflation does this if you're a cosmologist, that's completely straightforward. So let me go back to this issue. If you broke Lorentz invariance in the most brutal way, you're gonna be doing damage to things like the Bianchi identities and energy conservation, obviously. Do I care? Well, as long as it's not nowadays in conflict with experiment. No, I don't. So this is what happens. You end up with the Friedman equations in the usual way. If you basically transform the Hamilton's equations 
So the two, three plus one, if you apply that to a cosmological model with homogeneity and isotropy, you get the Friedman equations, actually. And they combine to give you energy conservation. If you do what I said, which is you break the diffeomorphism invariant, you do break these things. As I, as I said, this actually happens in Ojeva leaf sheets too. It happens here. And this is what happens when you actually work out through this. And this is the first non-trivial point I'm making. You get the coupling between the spatial curvature and C dot over C, which has the right sign if you have a decreasing speed of flight, which is what you need to solve the horizon problem. You get a violation with the right sign to stabilize the flat model. So you get basically an extra term, which is negative when you're supercritical, positive when you're subcritical. And what used to be unstable becomes actually stable when you solve the flatness problem. Great, hurrah, everyone is happy. Okay, this is just for fun, okay? This is also just a starter. Who cares about any of these? This is the problem. So cosmologists really invented all these problems. Are they real problems or not? The, the initial value problems. And I think it's fair to say that they're really kind of problems of people who thought too much about this subject until you get to this point. So why is the universe flat? Maybe because it is. Okay, it's not very satisfying, but why is it homogeneous? Maybe because it is. Okay, the horizon is tiny. What homogenizes the universe? I don't care, it is homogeneous. Okay. The problem is when it, in fact, the universe is actually not exactly homogeneous. When you look at what actually happens, you end up with fluctuations on top of homogeneity, which are really, really, really very well defined. This is the holy grail, I call it, of cosmology. If you take the moving curvature variable, take the Fourier transform, square it, take the k cube in front, this thing is dimensionless, so it must have a form like this, with the kc preferred scale here. If you don't want to have a scale, you have a scale invariant spectrum, ns must be one. This is your amplitude, which is dimensionless. Turns out that a is around 10 to the minus five, ns cannot be much, di very different from one. So this is really the challenge, and okay, so it's very nice that you can solve the horizon problem and blah, 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 breaking this or that symmetry, but this is really the issue. And let's go back to the, this range I said between lunatic and boring uh, theories. There's a lot of literature showing it is actually possible to have a varying speed of flight, in fact, even without breaking anything. You just have to do it very carefully. You don't need to do anything as extreme as what I've done. There's a range of things by means of which you can actually preserve, in some sense, Lorentz symmetry and certainly diffeomorphism invariant. So let's be sensible. Okay, and the most simple way to be sensible actually is just to take a bimetric theory. So in other words, you're breaking Lorentz invariance by having two representations of Lorentz invariance. So you don't have one Lorentz invariance, you actually have two, you have doubly Lorentz invariance if you want to be like Giovanni, okay. And what we have is two metrics, and you have one metric for gravity, which is your Einstein gravity, or your Einstein frame, from which you build your, if you want, Einstein build <coughs> action, then you have another metric which couples to matter, your matter frame, which is minimally coupled to matter. And what actually happens here is, you've seen these theories, right? In fact, you've seen one example of these theories. It's basically textbook stuff. When you study varying G, brenz dicke theories, if these two metrics are conformal, yeah, this conformal scale factor is some scalar, you have a scalar tensor theory, and specifically all you're doing is you're basically changing the gravitational coupling is nothing that unusual. So in a way, what I'm doing here is nothing but considering a transformation between these two metrics, which is this formal. For example, of this form, doesn't have to be, but take it for example of this form. If you do something like this, in Brent's Dickey, obviously the speed of gravity is the speed of light, but here it's not. And we have a light cone for gravity and a light cone for matter, which don't overlap, and the speed of the graviton is different from the speed of the massless particles in the matter sector. So as I said, there's nothing really dramatic if you do something like this. Question, what is the minimal bimetric VSL theory? Obviously, if you make this guy a constant, that's simple. So this is what I said before. You need to give some dynamics to your field phi. You know what to do with Burns Dickey. You just put something like the Klein-Gordon Lagrangian. You don't need to do it here. So let me postpone this issue. What is the simplest dynamics for one of these theories until I study the next thing, which is fluctuations. Okay, so now let's do serious business. Enough talk, enough pub talk, okay? Let's do real stuff, let's try and say, can I actually explain 
the macrowave background as it is, to zero order and preferably beyond that using a varying constant theory. Okay, the kind of fluctuations that come out of these theories can be worked out very simply because actually the formalism is very is similar to what is actually used for inflation, but with a varying speed of sound for the graviton. In other words, your graviton field, which usually has a speed of vibrations, which is the speed of light, is allowed to actually have a different speed. So this has been worked out in the context of theories of inflation called quiescence inflation, in which the kinetic terms are not quadratic. So if you do that, the speed of the, the inflaton is more complicated. You can work it out. I'll show you the formulae. And you end up with a theory of fluctuations, which is actually very simple and has been worked out. So you may have seen this equation. So thank someone to have worked this out for you. The final equation is very simple. The derivation is a nightmare. So it's the kind of thing every PhD student has got to do in cosmology. Uh, first three months or something, and they normally give up what they don't. They stay in the field. But you end up with a very simple equation. If you transform, eventually find that your moving gauge uh, curvature fluctuations should be transformed into a variable v, where this z, which transforms it, is proportional to the expansion factor, and you should divide by the speed of sound. If you really want to kind of in incorporate this extra degree of freedom, that's what happens. So I end up with an equation which is just an harmonic oscillator equation. So this is basically a usual harmonic oscillator equation but with a time varying tachyonic mass. That's the result, so you have term one, term two. When term one dominates, that's just microphysics, your system is responding to local pressure, to the local physics, you're inside the horizon. When term two dominates, you have an instability, that's called the gravitational instability. You're outside the horizon, your pressure becomes subdominant, your gravity dominates, and gravity tends to amplify fluctuations. So your tachyonic mass basically reflects an instability called the genes instability. And cosmological perturbation theory, as complicated as you might want to make it, is basically this. It's an interplay between these two terms. What happens? Who dominates first? Well, this is why the horizon problem is a problem. The horizon problem is, is a joke until you actually try to compute something. And you realize that in the usual models, in Big Bang theory, this guy becomes proportional to 1 over eta square conformal time. Conformal time grows from 0 to infinite. So this thing, for any k, Cs is a constant. For any k which is a constant, which is a moving k, this guy is going to dominate initially. So you start outside the horizon, so you don't know what to do. So that's the tragedy of the horizon problem. It's not so much I have an horizon, blah, blah, blah. So I can't compute anything. There have been speculations that maybe I can set initial conditions outside the horizon. Maybe I can just quantum fluctuate from nothing into a universe with the right spectrum. Maybe I can, maybe it's Christmas, I don't know. So basically there is an issue about what to do, but a simplest thing to do is let's try and reverse this and get this guy to dominate first. Then I start inside the horizon, I solve the horizon problem, and then leave. And then I set initial conditions in the usual way which I do in quantum field theory. So that's exactly how inflation takes the bunny out of the hat. That's exactly the story, the realization that if you break this condition, the strong energy condition, if the pressure is sufficiently negative, conformal time is negative and grows to zero, which is a mathematical way of saying you solve the horizon problem. And in fact, this guy dominates later. So if CS is a constant, this guy dominates first. This guy grows from minus infinity to zero. So this guy only dominates later. You start inside the horizon, you leave the horizon. And now you can say, what happens to my mode initially? <coughs> it's a vacuum state, it's a thermal state. Take your pick. But now you can actually start doing physics from first principles. OK, but why scale invariance? This obviously opens up a window for solving the problem. Now, this is the cool thing. That's the miracle of inflation. The miracle of inflation is that if you're near the sitter, you end up with something near scale invariant which is remarkable. And the reason is the following, so you may not like this argument, but that's basically what is textbook these days. Normalize your oscillations in a way that when I second quantize, these amplitudes become creation and annihilation operators. Solve the system near the sitter. So now you have to be very careful. You go back here and you adjust your W to B to find what happens. You get a factor, you get a two over eta square near the sitter. That gives you a solution. You just have to work it out. 
And this is your solution. You don't like thermal states, you want a vacuum state, okay? Then you do vacuum fluctuations. What are the vacuum fluctuations? You will work this out, this guy is just a constant, basically, to end up with the square of these, and miracle happens. So inside your horizon, you're not scale invariant. Your fluctuations go like one over k. But this extra guy here, this extra factor gives you one over k cubed, and I end up with scale invariant. Ta-da, great. Everyone is happy. You can try to do a similar thing in theories with a varying speed of light, which as I'll show in a minute, these bimetric theories, you basically, it's this speed of sound that appears there, okay? So let's imagine I don't inflate, let's not mix everything, let's not mix, mix fish and meat, okay, very different things. So this eta is still conformal time growing from zero to infinity. So this guy still diverges. So in order to solve the horizon problem, I need the CS, my speed of sound, to diverge faster. And then I do start inside the horizon and leave the horizon. Okay, you have a similar question. Let's ask, let's repeat the calculation. What is specifically the profile which gives me scale invariance? So you go through the calculation, same story, now the speed of sound is changing. You have to take a WKB solution, but these things are in textbooks. You work it out, you solve it, same story, and then you ask the question, what kind of profile should I have in the speed of sound to get scale invariance? Now this could have been a very complicated thing, which depends on the equation of state, which depends on all kinds of mess. I was very surprised when I got this result, very interesting. There is a universal law. As long as the speed of sound goes like the density of the universe, I get the scale invariant spectrum, regardless of the details or anything. So this is interesting, and um, let's see what this means in a minute, because of course my question is what's the minimal th bimetric theory? How does this match? <laughs> Incidentally, this is expected. This has been a bit more technical in the last few slides. For experts only, if you've ever worked on k-essence, you probably remember this formula. So this formula, is the, re the reason why this appears, why, the reason why you change the speed of sound of the inflaton in inflation, k essence inflation, is to change the tensor scalar ratio, to bump up or bump down the scalars. And this is done with a constant CS, okay? Now actually this guy is as the mode leaves the horizon, okay? And you can see immediately, if you actually know this formula, that in a way it's expected that if the CS is proportional to rho, you do get scale invariant because this thing doesn't change. 10 to the minus 5, okay, zero order there's not just scaling variance. 10 to the minus 5, where it, does it come from? This is a major clue. We have 10 to the minus 5 written in the sky, okay? And I think what this is telling us is that there are two scales in physics, obviously. One is the Planck scale, and then there is another scale, which is Planck scale, and some power of 10 to the minus 5. Obviously, there is some kind of two scales there, otherwise you would never have got 10 to the minus 5 in any theory. Well, here, this is obvious. So we don't want the speed of light to be changing nowadays like rho. That would contradict everything, right? So you wait a little bit, the rho of the universe decreases, C changes. No, that doesn't work. So you want the C to go like rho very early on and then flatten. And then the question is at what scale do you want C to go like rho? And you can work out basically what this means is that that ratio is what fixes the 10 to the minus five. So in other words, C being proportional, yeah? Yes. yes. Okay, so these are the two things that I need to incorporate. Later on, we're going to complicate this slightly more, but the zero order is essentially this. So now let's go back to the, mini, to the bimetric theory. So the question now is, okay, this is what I learned as a cosmologist and I should have obtained. Let's see how this can be incorporated into something which is not totally bonkers like what I did earlier on. Like a, but something more, more conservative, I'm getting old, so let's do bimetric theory. Let's see what kind of, the question there is what kind of dynamics for this field relating this formal matrix would reproduce a speed of sound like the one I need, okay? So this is an interesting exercise. Again, let me show you something funny, okay? I was very surprised by this. It's a very cool result. Suppose, forget about Klein-Gordon's, you can try that, but. Let's imagine I just have a cosmological constant in the matter frame. Now, all these calculations I've showed you are done in the Einstein frame. So we have to basically project these into the Einstein frame. And there's a very simple way, which is basically algebra. I have to set an exam in relativity. It's the kind of thing I'm going to ask. Just work out the determinant. If you have a metric like I showed you here, 
And you basically just have to work out the volume and how the volume square root of a G maps into the Einstein frame. So you get something which I'm sure you've seen, the DBI action. In other words, a cosmological constant becomes a DBI action. And more specifically, this is actually the more concrete way to do this. If we take a positive lambda in the Einstein frame, balanced by a neg negative lambda of the same size in the matter frame, if you project everything into the Einstein frame, you end up with a DBI action, but we determine this guy completely the wrong side. So as you know, DBI theories in DBI inflation you have a lower speed of sound. If you flip the coupling, you have a higher speed of sound. Okay, so it's exactly the opposite. Now, what is funny is that these things have been worked out for kappa essence, or k essence, as I pointed out. So you probably have seen these, and now there's a way to compute the equation of state in inflation. Depends on the V, depends on the K. You have kinetic terms, you have a potential. Kappa essence is basically what happens when this guy is allowed to be different from quadratic. So there are formulae which you can work out for the equation of state, and there are formulae you can work out for the speed of sound, which only depend on this guy, only depend on the kinetic term. Okay, let's see what happens to that. That's what you get. So in other words, something which is just a cosmological constant in the matter frame projects into a DBI action in the Einstein frame with the wrong sign. You work out the equation for the speed of sound, and you get the right scaling for getting scaling variant fluctuations. So this is even more remarkable, okay? Not only is it possible to identify a universal varying speed of sound theory associated with scaling variance, but this law happens to be realized by the minimal bimetric theory, which is in fact associated when you project it to the Einstein frame with one thing we, this was the referee's idea, one thing we call the anti-DBI model. What's the sign? This guy here. We have the lambda has to be positive in the Einstein frame and negative in the matter frame. The sitter is when everything is in one frame, and then you get the sitter. Like the sitter is when you have general relativity and you put the cosmological constant, you get the sitter. Okay? So this is not the sitter. So the, you end up with the Friedman model. No? Using? You're using the wrong theory. <laughs> it's not a matter of sign. Oh, if this was relativity, you yeah. mean? Okay. So if this was relativity, this would, be, this would have been the sitter. The sitter. But in fact, you work this out, and you, what you get is Freeman, Robertson, Walker with a, a W, which is actually not inflationary. So this is, this is one thing I should have emphasized. You don't want to mix in, you don't want cooking with too many ingredients. This thing does not inflate, okay? You're actually solving the horizon problem, not with inflation, but with the varying speed of sound, and you're getting scaling variant fluctuations because of this uh, CS profile, <coughs> not because of the equation of state, okay? So this is not minus one, don't worry, it's not the sitter or anti the sitter. It would have been, which is the question you asked. Okay, next. This is the zeroth order holy grail. What I did with Federico here was mess this up. And I was, you know, I was a bit reluctant to do this initially. I mean, I like, I like theories without parameters, but anyway, the issue here is, suppose we don't have scale invariant. Can we actually accommodate something which is almost scale invariant, but not quite? And the answer is actually surprisingly simple. If you put the power law in this coupling here and keep everything as it was, you actually end up with a tilted spectrum, which can be red or blue, with a function you can work out in terms of this power. Now, I was a bit reluctant about this because, I mean, I, rather offensively, sometimes I call inflation the theory of anything, because you can prove anything. You just make the model complicated enough and you can prove anything, it's completely unfair, okay? I used to say this, it's not completely true. It is true if you complicate the model a lot. But there are actually consistency relations in inflation. For example, relating tensor modes and scalar modes. Yeah, you're sure, you can, if you complicate the model, you can evade them. But it's not true you can produce any NS you want, any spectral index. You can, but then things change elsewhere. <coughs> so it's actually the same thing here. This is why I, you know, where I found this cool. It's true that I can complicate that minimal model I gave you to accommodate a spectrum which is not strictly scale invariant, but which is, for example, NS.96. I just make that coupling a power instead of a constant. But the fact, I, what I, in a way, I don't have tensor modes here, by the way, because I haven't solved the horizon problem for, for the gravitons. 
So I have no tensor modes here. And surprisingly, where you find the consistency relations is in this guy, the three-point function, which is something Planck might conceivably measure, okay? So let's go into non-Gaussianity. These things predict not only the power spectrum, not only the quadratic correlators, let's go to the cubic correlators. And first of all, let's imagine, let's look, let's compare, let's contrast inflation with this theory in the case in which I do get strict scale invariance. And what you find is that you end up with a profile like this, which is called the equilateral shape for this guy. And immediately, so the shape is not that unusual, this is immediately what you find. You actually find a novel prediction with respect to inflation. This thing called FNL, which is basically that guy at amplitude, turns out to be one, plus one. So in inflation, you find something positive, which goes like the slow rolling parameter, which is typically very small. Standard inflation gives you very small FNL. DBI inflation, so if I do DBI not anti-DBI and put inflation on top, then it's the citra. Okay, and then what you find is FNL becomes minus 100. So it's big but negative. It's probably already ruled out. So you get something in between, right? So even if NS is one, you find that actually FNL will be distinctly different from that obtained from inflation. Different sign from standard inflation, but smaller than DBI inflation. Now this is what I found cool, okay? I hate having theories with more and more parameters so that you cannot fix everything. Let's imagine I go beyond the minimal model and I work out the three point function then I find that this initial shape, which is very simple, gets complicated with a term which is proportional to ns minus one. So in other words, I can actually, I only have one extra parameter, but I have two predictions. So I can actually make the ns not one, but then there's a consistency condition between the tilt of the spectrum and the actual shape of the three-point function, which I think is nice. So in other words, this is not another theory of anything. I think it's actually, Interesting, you certainly can, can shoot at it and you could kill it eventually or not. Basically, you're not introducing more parameters, so what, you, what I'm asking is that once you have the Planck data to try and do a likelihood with an extra parameter, which has implications both for the tilt and for the three-point function. It's a reasonable thing to ask. And given that the FNL is order one, um, that's basically like borderline, maybe it is measurable. So anyway, let me conclude and then make one final remark. Breaking Lorentz invariance is good for you if you're a cosmologist, okay? I'm not sure it's good for you in general, for your heart, if you're, uh, you know, teaching relativity, because it's normally much more complicated. But certainly it provides an alternative to inflation for solving the cosmological problems, which is observationally distinct from inflation, and which has one advantage, which is, although we don't talk to each other, this when the workshop has shown it, it branches off into other areas very quickly, namely, namely quantum gravity. And it could be there is actually something completely different there, not inflation, which connects with quantum gravity more easily. Are you going to do the jump or not, leap or not? That is the issue. Some people think it's too much to give up for too little, for too little gain. I actually, I agree, cosmology is going to be the testing ground, as it was said in the last talk. But for that to be true, we really need to start doing cosmology in a less phenomenological, in a less naive way. So just to finish, I just added this on because I thought it might be useful. Problem with DSR, okay, I was gonna talk a bit about DSR, then I gave up, then I think in the end. It's interesting. What I said in the last few transparencies can actually be done with DSR. The problem with DSR is, um, is the following. Unfortunately, with DSR, we don't know how to do curved space-time. Therefore, strictly speaking, we don't know how to do cosmology. And there's been a big issue about whether the Freeman equations change or don't change. I personally think the Ojava Lifshitz approach might be a nice way to do DSR and in curved space time in a way which is probably consistent. Anyway, if you put some assumptions about the fact that gravity doesn't change very much, okay, with DSR, and you put DSR on top, it's actually interesting. You do, there is also a universal prescription in DSR with this proviso, which I I was completely honest about it. But with this proviso, there is also a universal law, like the CS going like rho. There is a universal law for obtaining scale invariance. Let's imagine I have a dispersion relation of this form, and I put all the dispersion in the P, because I don't want to mess up the time derivatives if I have a field theory, okay? But that's basically a technical thing. So we have an energy-dependent speed of light. Well, one thing which is not completely obvious is when I do cosmology, 
those k's I've been writing are commoving wave vectors. I take one, one guy which has a commoving wave vector k, which is a constant, but the physical wave vectors changes with the expansion of the universe. Okay? So although these things are energy dependent speed of light, they become by proxy time dependent speed of light because of the expansion. Once I convert these guys, my k is using cosmology into physical k's, the a appears there, the a depends on time, therefore as the universe expands, I'm basically, when I, if I focus on a given moving mode, I'm scanning the whole dispersion relation. And you can work out exactly how you're doing it. So fix on a mode, wait enough time, and you see the whole dispersion relation unfold before your eyes. So this is, you can work this out, you work out the same story. There's the same proviso here, I'm assuming the theory of gravity hasn't changed too much. So you go through it, you can work out how the equation changes, and you work out a general law as well for scale invariance. And this is a weird thing. What you find is that it doesn't matter what the equation of state is, you always find some deformation of relativity which gives you scale invariance in the fluctuations. And in this case, this is what I get. So I get omega square minus k square, and then I have to put the k to the fourth here. And this lambda is the thing that gives me 10 to the minus 5, comes out to be this in terms of the Planck length. So I think this is really cool. This has been not completely appreciated, but this is actually the ojava lifshitz dispersion relation. Omega going like a cube. So it looks like, you know, if you try to do the form dispersion relations and you focus on one particular kind of deformation, which goes like basically k cube, which gives you scale invariance, you also seem to solve these divergence problems in quantum gravity. And I find this tantalizing, but not quite fully convincing yet. As I said, there's a lot of work to do. This is just a finish here. This is just as an exercise for the student. Okay. Thank you. So there is a first, first question. Yeah. Well, I have a question about the, um, the stability of this theorist of this last proposal, well, not this one, the one before. So do you check that there is no Gauche state, that the theory is unitary, and whether the cutoff is high? I mean, things that for now. So we're starting, this is where there's this big division between cosmologists and particle physicists. No, no, we don't care. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you should ask the question. And the answer is um, no. If, if, I, if I have two gravitons, I have a problem. So if my two Gs are actually two independent degrees of freedom, yes, I have that problem. But if I have a scalar field, no, I don't. But that's not true. I mean, for instance, uh, in this case, essence is not that sometimes the cutoff can be very, very low, meaning that you cannot use this theory in perturbation theory for this, I mean, small scale, so. Perturbation theory in what sense? In the sense of Feynman diagrams or in the sense of cosmological perturbation? In any. I mean, if the- Cosmological perturbation theory, I can. It's all classic. No, well, if the cut, if the, yeah. I mean, okay. If you don't know where the non-perturbative I mean, meaning also classical non-perturbative, okay. Effects are big or no, you, can, you are not allowed to use perturbation theory, let's say. Well, the basically, you can this say is something that you can you compute. Can, if, if, you, your criticism is applicable to any kappa essence theory. Yes. Okay. Well, and then you can but, compute the kappa. But cutoff. I think if you make them a bimetric, you'd say that all your quantum field theory calculations are actually done in the matter frame. In which case, they're actually constant speed, right? So you'd end up with everything. So basically, it's when you project into the Einstein frame that I get these non-quadratic kinetical terms and ghosts and everything. But no one told you to do the calculation there, right? So it's... So the, the, the main issue which I can see you're asking is when I have a vertex with the, with the graviton, matter frames and the graviton, okay? And then you just say, no one told you to compute those things, okay? <laughs> Yeah. Right, so you can work it out, and it's basically... Oh, the so it hasn't been done? It's obvious, it's very small, it'd be a very small variation.
Yes, it has been done. It was in the paper. Not a very strong sense of security, you're saying. No, what happened? No, no, what, what, what I meant is just, just a... Yeah. Let's, let's allow for some late time variation of the okay. in sure. the small SJM. So in other words, you don't want this guy to be one. You want some power there or something. I, I want it to be, you know, frozen here on the Earth. Not, not going back to inflation, but right. to so, on. so this kind of this kind of guy, you can work it out. It's tiny, okay. But then you, know, you obviously you could cook up something with which that's not true, right? But I have could, could, would be would be acceptable. Oh, no, yeah. see, so in fact, as you know, when 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 Webb and your your collaborator came up with varying alpha, people were trying not to freeze this too much because that would have an implication on varying alpha at ten to the minus five. So that's varying alpha, but not not necessarily. Yeah, but varying C had implications on varying alpha, as you as you found out. So that, at that time, that was seen in that way. Um, yeah, as I said, unfortunately, the data didn't seem to pan out. That's the tragedy of our lives, isn't it? I mean, every time we find an anomaly, it just becomes a system. Basically learning a lot about systematics, which is good. Not good for fundamental physics. No. I have a comment and a question. Uh, the comment is that the type of DBI action you were using is an action that describes tachyons in string theory with one difference that typically there is a potential sitting in front of square root of g hat. And indeed, in fact, via holography, this describes also carrier symmetry breaking QCD like theories. The question is you mentioned that in order to get a running of the spectral index, you needed to add the power of phi in front of the, the phi square in the metric. But I thought that this well, you that's, could. Let's backtrack. I don't think that's even true. I mean, I, I don't know much string theory, but I. No, no, forget string theory now. That, the question okay, is about why something. You talk about it? <laughs> Sorry, because the issue is. Oh. <laughs> okay, okay. That was a comment. Okay. Now is the question. Okay. The question is you mentioned, if I understood correctly, that if you want to get running, that is, go beyond the uh, conformal result, uh, you have to add the power of phi in front of the phi square and definition of the metric. Is right. that, did I understand correctly? Yeah. Uh, but this you could, seems you could redefine it away. So how do you get a difference in the running? Redefining, because um, you lose the minimal coupling to the matter, so you have to be very careful with those redefinitions. No, no, the metric In fact, we did use those redefinitions to the calculation. What I'm trying to say is if, you, if beta is phi to the alpha, this can be written as the mu of a different power of phi, and this is everywhere right, in the metric. Which is what you try to do, you remember that. And it's, why, is, why is it wrong? It appears somewhere else, I keep forgetting where. If the only thing that appears are the two metrics, I don't see how. Maybe we can discuss it later. No, it's the, it's the action. The action in the field phi then is completely different. So in, in other words, if you do that. So okay, you have to add the potential for phi, for example, or something? How do yeah, you modify yeah, the action? Well, yeah, exactly. That's what it is. Okay. So, I mean, you can't have it everywhere. You can redefine the field, but it appears somewhere else. Yeah. In fact, we ended up using that trick because it was easier to do it somewhere else at some point. But we did, we did this calculation like two years ago or something. So. I can't remember the details, well, one year ago. One last uh, question. I had uh, two very naive questions concerning your model with CS uh, that goes like four. Uh, the first one is, uh, uh, what happens to the three-point function in the squeeze limit? Whether to the what, sorry? The what happens to the three function? point function that you showed in the squeeze limit, whether it satisfies a Maldacina consistency relation. And the second one is uh, uh, whether you want to use this model to, um, to solve horizon problem so for the other fields. Uh, yeah. My brain cannot deal with two things okay. at the same time. Okay, let's do this one. I think it, you mean the collapsed one. Yeah. That's what you get. So these guys are actually change. You can see what happens. You get, you get, a, you get a small collapsed one. Yeah. And you can actually see it in these plots. You can actually see these appearing. Okay. Okay. Very good. One. You just see them appearing. There's like a small. Yeah. Second question. Yeah. The second is uh, no. Whether um, you want to use uh, this model to solve uh, also horizon problem for the other fields, except uh, so it will. It right. probably will solve it for the K essence, but uh, no, you solve it for the matter. 
You solve it for the matter as well. You, so you, you assume. Although matter does not have the same. Yeah, speed we just of sound. Leave, so matter is like a subdominant contribution. In fact, I thought what happens if you have some matter there, but in, yeah, uh, the, the fluctuations are in this field phi. Mm -hmm. But you do solve the horizon problem for these extra fields. And I thought, what if you have also some for the gravitons? You said you don't. No, no for the gravitons you don't obviously. Uh, because so why, if you have a because you have two. You have two light cones. You have the gravity light cone, which is basically yeah. you go to the, the Einstein frame and that's fixed. And then you have the other one, which is open up, yeah, but which, is, which is for the field phi and for all the matter frames. So, so, the, so the speed of anything minimally coupled to this guy is going to follow that, that light cone, which so is open up. Any other field with the uh, CS equal to 1? Uh, any other field, exactly. I guess speed, yeah. 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 For those fields, uh, the, the horizon problem will, will be satisfied. So th there is potential there. I just have never found a simple way to use it. There is potential there. In fact, I thought we could go beyond NS equals 1 using those fields. But it's not obvious initially. It was much easier to change this coupling instead. Thanks again, uh, Dujo. <laughs> so now we have a break uh, for lunch, and we are going to start again at 2.30 sharp. <laughs>